the Kings and Queens of Scotland. Part 4. The House of Stuart, 1437-1567 Magnificent and rugged, Scotland has long been a country of fierce independence and brutal power struggles. In the first three episodes, we met the ancient Alpen warrior kings who fought off Vikings and bound kingdoms together. The Dunkeld cousins, including Macbeth, who murdered each other over the throne and tried to take advantage of the Norman invasion. And the many dynasties who battled the English and each other during the Wars of Independence, including the Stuarts who came out on top. In this episode, we'll meet more Stuart monarchs, one who inspired the red wedding scene in Game of Thrones, another whose vendetta against his uncle, Henry VIII, cost him his life, and Mary Queen of Scots, who plotted to assassinate her cousin Elizabeth I and lost her head for it. James II was six when he inherited the throne. The assassins who killed his father, James I, intended to kidnap him as well. But Queen Joan, though wounded, managed to escape with her son. His mother made quick work of gaining support amongst the Scottish lords and the Pope. She rounded up, tortured, and executed the men responsible for her husband's assassination. But the king's minority left plenty of opportunity for others to squabble for power. Around this time, Edinburgh replaced Schoon as the capital of Scotland. A rivalry grew between the keepers of Edinburgh Castle and Stirling Castle. Joan sided with Stirling and smuggled the king there in a trunk. But when she married one of his enemies, Stirling had the couple arrested and seized the young king. King James's cousin, the Lieutenant General of the Realm, the Earl of Douglas, had recently died, and his 16-year-old son William had inherited his position. He stood between Stirling and control of Scotland. William and his 12-year-old brother David were invited to meet the king at Edinburgh Castle. Together they enjoyed a royal feast and entertainment. During the celebration, a black bull's head, a symbol of death, was placed in front of the earl. Suddenly, the Douglas boys were seized by Stirling and his men, dragged into the castle yard, and beheaded all while the 10-year-old king cried and pled for his cousin's lives. The incident became known as the Black Dinner and inspired Game of Thrones author George R. R. Martin to write the infamous Red Wedding Scene. Sterling gave the title Earl of Douglas to one of his own allies, and a war broke out between he and Edinburgh. Edinburgh seized possession of the young king, and Queen Mother Joan sided with him. But she died while under siege by Stirling, who won the battle. By the time James was 18, he was done being a pawn. He made a prestigious marriage to Mary of Gilders, niece of the wealthy Duke of Burgundy. The union brought him international status, lucrative trade, and the latest in artillery. But James owed his new bride an expensive dowry, so he removed Stirling from power, seized his lands, and gifted them to Mary. King James had a wine-colored birthmark on half of his face, which was thought to be a sign of a rash temper, and earned him the nickname Fiery Face. The king's new rival was the young, handsome Earl of Douglas, so he invited him to dinner. Over dinner, the men argued, and the infuriated king stabbed Douglas to death. James's guards joined in and hacked the earl to pieces. They threw his corpse out the window. Having established violent dominance, James turned his sights on England, where he could take advantage of the Wars of the Roses, the conflict between two branches of the royal family. James played both sides while trying to persuade the King of France to launch a joint invasion. While laying siege to Roxborough Castle, King James went out to inspect his cannons. One of them exploded and killed him instantly. At the age of 29, his reign was cut short. James III was only nine, but his mother, Queen Mary, was an effective regent. She completed her husband's conquest of Roxborough Castle. 
In England, King Henry VI was captured by the Yorks. His wife, Margaret of Anjou, and their son, Edward Prince of Wales, fled to Scotland. The two queens agreed an alliance and a marriage between Prince Edward and Mary's daughter. The Scots backed Margaret in attacking Edward IV, who had just declared himself king. But they were defeated and ran back to Scotland. Now secure on the throne, the English king proposed to Mary. She declined, but she did agree to switch sides and ally with him instead. Queen Mary died suddenly at 28, leaving her young son vulnerable. While he was out hunting, he was kidnapped by Robert Lord Boy, who then forced the king to pardon him for kidnapping him and declare him governor. Boyd further insulted and infuriated the king by marrying his 13-year-old sister Mary to his own son. Boyd regained some favor by negotiating a match between the king and Margaret of Denmark. James, now 17, was pleased with the marriage, but he was ready to take back control. When Boyd and his son landed in Scotland with the royal bride, the king planned to arrest them. But his sister Mary, who had fallen in love with her husband, warned the Boyds and they all escaped to Bruges. King James wed 13-year-old Margaret of Denmark. They soon produced three sons, but didn't get along. She was very pious and would only sleep with him for conception. Still, he was not known to have had any mistresses. Her father did not have sufficient funds to pay her dowry, so James kept the islands of Orkney and Shetland, which were still under Norse control instead. The Lords of the Isles had been a semi-independent thorn in the side of previous Scottish kings. But James called the current lord to court and seized all his land. Thus, James III completed the creation of modern Scotland. Despite this, he wasn't popular with his people, in addition to the Stuart tendency to be dictatorial and tax his people, James also played sides in foreign wars, refused to travel around his own country to oversee justice, and elevated a number of low-born favorites. James came into conflict with his brothers, Alexander Duke of Albany and David Earl of Bore. Battles ensued during which David was captured and imprisoned. He mysteriously bled to death in the bath. Alexander was charged with treason, but escaped to France. From there, he made a bargain with King Edward IV of England. Edward lent Alexander troops, led by his brother Richard of Gloucester, while on the march to face off against his brother. King James was seized by his own nobles. They hanged his low-born favorites from a bridge and held the king prisoner in Edinburgh. Then a counter-coup was staged by the king's uncles. When Alexander finally arrived in Edinburgh, he was shocked to learn of all that had happened in his absence. Queen Margaret stepped in and got Alexander to agree to rescue the brother he had come to dethrone. Everyone agreed that James would remain king, but Alexander would be lieutenant. Alexander ended up being even more of a tyrant than his brother. So, in short order, the nobles chased him back to England and restored James to power. After all that, everything was back to how it had started. Alexander tried another invasion with his old friend, who was now King Richard III, but he was captured and imprisoned. His friends sent him a keg of wine with a rope concealed inside. He got his jailers drunk and then slit their throats and used the rope to climb out a window. He escaped to France and was making plans for a third invasion when he got a lance through the eye during a jousting match and died. James III made peace with Richard III, and when he was killed in battle, James made peace with his vanquisher, Henry VII. Next, James had to deal with a rebellious son. The king had been living apart from his wife, Queen Margaret, for some time. Their eldest son, 15-year-old James, Duke of Rothesay, was living with her. Their second son, also named James but Duke of Ross, was living with his father. The king appeared to favor Ross and even began negotiating for him to marry an English royal bride. 
Rothesay feared that he would be cut out of the succession, so he attacked his father. The unpopular king couldn't get many nobles on his side, and his son's forces overwhelmed him at the Battle of Sochiburn. According to legend, the king escaped the battle and hid in a nearby mill, but he was slain by an assassin disguised as a priest. He was 37 and was succeeded by his eldest son. James IV was 15 when he was crowned at Schoon. He didn't officially have a regent, but allowed his counselors to run the country for a few years while he enjoyed himself. At 21, James peacefully took over the government. Unlike his father and grandfather, he was a popular monarch. He knew how to charm people and actually cared what they thought. James was a Renaissance king. He was interested in art, law, literature, and science. He personally experimented with dentistry and bloodletting, but he let the professionals take over and founded the Royal College of Surgeons, making Scotland a center for medical advancement. He also established the University of Aberdeen and made education compulsory for the eldest sons of landowners. James brought the printing press to Scotland. He commissioned the Palace of Holyrood House and Falkland Palace, and made extensive updates to Linlithgow Palace and Edinburgh and Stirling Castles. He founded two dockyards, which built 38 ships, significantly expanding the Scottish Navy. During his reign, royal revenue more than doubled, and he exercised royal authority in the Highlands and the Isles, areas which had long been defiant. He took the Scottish Church in hand and was rewarded by the Pope with a magnificent scepter and sword of state. These make up two-thirds of the modern crown jewels, known as the Honours of Scotland. James IV was the most successful of the Stuart kings. Domestic bliss meant that he could focus on the centuries-old hobby of Scottish kings, fighting with the English. Down south, Richard III had imprisoned and probably murdered the rightful king, Edward V, and his younger brother. Richard was then killed in battle, and his rival became King Henry VII and founded the Tudor dynasty. A man named Perkin Warbeck emerged, claiming that he was one of the long-lost princes in the tower. James supported the pretender's attempt to invade England. Things didn't work out for Warbeck, who was captured and beheaded, but James hadn't really expected him to win. He just used him to irritate Henry VII and force him to take Scotland seriously. In 1502, the two kings signed the Treaty of Perpetual Peace, and James was betrothed to Henry's eldest daughter, Margaret Tudor. The chivalrous king made an informal trip to meet his future bride. They talked and discovered a mutual love of music. After he left, she commented to her ladies that she liked him well enough, but his beard was too long. When she met him again at their lavish wedding at Holyrood House, he was clean-shaven. Margaret was just 13 and James 30. But after the diplomatically critical wedding night, he did not sleep with his wife again until she was 17. The couple were happy together and kept a merry court. Sadly, four of their children were stillborn or died in infancy. Margaret eventually delivered a healthy son, James. In 1509, her father died, and her brother was crowned King Henry VIII. The 18-year-old king wanted victory on the battlefield, so he blew up his father's carefully crafted alliances and joined up with the Spanish and the Vatican to invade France. Scotland was honor-bound by the Auld Alliance to attack England, though going against the Pope meant he was excommunicated. As Henry was busy glory-hunting in France, his heavily pregnant wife, Catherine of Aragon, rode north to face James at the Battle of Flodden. The king fought valiantly, but the Scots were slaughtered. The next morning, the king's corpse was identified among the dead soldiers. His lower jaw had been shattered by an arrow, and his throat sliced with spears. James was the last British monarch to be killed on the battlefield. 
His otherwise successful 25-year reign was cut short when he was just 40. Queen Catherine ordered her brother-in-law's bloody coat sent to her husband as a trophy. Because James had been excommunicated, the English were not obliged to bury him in hollow ground. His coffin was kept in storage in Sheen Priory for 80 years. During the reign of Elizabeth I, workmen pried it open and used his desiccated head as a football. King James's body has since been lost. James V was 17 months old when he became king. His father's will named his mother, Margaret, as regent. She was pregnant and too unwell to take an active role in politics. And because her brother's army had just wiped out a generation of Scottish nobles, she wasn't particularly popular. After delivering a healthy second son, Margaret got to work. She negotiated peace with her brother and tried to get the Scottish nobles on side. But the lonely widow made the mistake of falling for charismatic Archibald Douglas, Earl of Angus. By remarrying, she gave up her legal right to be regent. Albany took the job and he demanded that Margaret give him custody of her two sons. The queen mother was terrified. Her own mother's brothers had been murdered under similar circumstances. She secretly plotted with her brother to flee with her children, but she was forced to hand them over. Baby Henry died at just 16 months old, but it was a clear case of infant mortality, not foul play. Margaret soon realized that her new husband had a mistress, and together they were spending all of her money. She wrote to her brother for support in a divorce, and Henry hypocritically replied that marriage was for life. Margaret bid her time. While Albany was on a diplomatic mission to France, she staged a coup and put her now 12-year-old son in power. Next, her estranged husband, Angus, showed up with an army, seized his stepson, and ruled in his name. Furious, Margaret wrote to the Pope and was finally granted an annulment. At 16, King James was able to escape Angus and ride to his mother at Stirling. He took control of the government and had Angus and the entire Douglas family exiled. The young king tightened royal control and enriched himself. He also enjoyed a string of mistresses and fathered at least nine illegitimate children. At 25, he decided to settle down with a nice treaty. Numerous foreign powers were interested in an alliance. His mother encouraged a union with Henry VIII's daughter, Princess Mary. But James was still salty about his father's death and went with the old favorite, France. King Francois I's eldest daughter, Madeline, had tuberculosis, and he was not keen to send her to Chile, Scotland. Instead, he offered another princess, Marie du Bourbon. James traveled to France in disguise to meet her, though he had already sent his portrait and arrived with six ships and 500 men, so everyone knew it was him. Upon meeting Mary, James was unimpressed, either with her person or her pedigree. He went to meet Madeline and the pair fell in love. They begged her father to permit the union, and he threw them a luxurious wedding at Notre Dame. The newlyweds sailed back to Scotland, but a stormy crossing was hard on Madeline's health. She died two months later in her husband's arms. Heartbroken, James immediately sent an envoy back to France for a new wife. Francois offered Mary de Guise, who had recently been widowed. James ordered new crowns for her lavish coronation ceremony. Hers has been lost, but his survives and is the last part of the honors of Scotland. Mary brought sophistication to the Scottish court. James loved music and playing the lute. The couple took a cruise around the Isles to broaden royal influence. Mary gave birth to two sons, but when baby James was 10 months old and Arthur just eight days old, both boys died on the same day, likely of illness. Margaret, the queen mother, died of a stroke later that year. The king was grief-stricken and looked for an outlet. 
By this time, his uncle, Henry VIII, had broken with the Catholic Church to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. Henry badgered his nephew to join him in the Reformation, but James, still bitter and without his mother to keep the peace, refused and sided with Rome. James kissed his pregnant wife goodbye and rode south to attack his uncle. He lost the Battle of Solway Moss. He survived but contracted a case of dysentery. In illness and defeat, the king suffered a nervous breakdown. On his deathbed, he received the news of the birth of his third and only surviving legitimate child, a daughter. He died at 30, leaving the crown on the tiny head of six-day-old Mary. Two powerful men vied for the regency, Catholic Cardinal Beaton and the Protestant Earl of Arran. Arran negotiated a peace treaty with England, which agreed that the young queen would wed Henry VIII's five-year-old son, Prince Edward. But the cardinal persuaded Parliament to reject the treaty and continue the French alliance. Outraged, Henry VIII launched a military campaign, known as the Rough Wooing. Raids on Scotland continued for nine years, even after Henry died and his son became Edward VI. For her own safety, five-year-old Queen Mary was sent to be raised at the French court with her betrothed, Francois Le Dauphin. The young queen was vivacious, beautiful, and clever, and was loved by her new French in-laws. Her own French mother remained in Scotland to secure the throne. Mary played the lute and virginals, wrote poetry, enjoyed horse riding, falconry, and needlework, and spoke several languages. She was an odd match with her short and awkward fiancé. The couple grew up like siblings, but at 14 and 15, they were wed at Notre Dame Cathedral, and Francois became King Consort of Scotland. Mary changed the spelling of the House of Stuart from the Scotch with an E-W to the French with a U. Edward VI didn't long outlive his father. His throne went next to his Catholic sister Mary and then to his Protestant sister Elizabeth. Catholics considered Elizabeth illegitimate, so King Henri II of France declared that the rightful Queen of England was the next person in the line of succession, Margaret Tudor's granddaughter, Mary Queen of Scots. But before he could fight for his daughter-in-law's throne, Henri was impaled through the eye during a joust. He left the French throne to his 15-year-old son, Francois II. The teenage couple reigned for 18 months, but Mary's maternal uncles, the Guise brothers, terrorized them and did most of the actual ruling. They massacred Protestants, igniting the French wars of religion. Francoise developed an ear infection, which led to an abscess in his brain that killed him. Mary, now an 18-year-old widow, returned to Scotland. Her mother had died the previous year, and she was stepping blindly into a political hornet's nest. In her absence, Protestantism had grown, and her subjects condemned her for hearing mass, dancing, and dressing elaborately. She tried to appeal to the Protestants, but this outraged the Catholics. Rather than dealing with the problems in the kingdom she did rule, Mary was focused on the kingdom she might rule, England. Her cousin Elizabeth proposed that Mary wed her old favorite, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. The Virgin Queen had refused to marry herself, and she promised to make Mary and Dudley's son her heir. But Mary didn't want her cousin's ex-boyfriend. Instead, she fell hard for another cousin, handsome Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley. He was Margaret Tudor's grandson through her second marriage, so their children would have a double claim to the English throne. Once the passionate honeymoon was over, Mary saw clearly that Darnley was vain, arrogant, and violent. She had named him King Consort, but he demanded more power. In a jealous rage, he stabbed Mary's secretary, David Rizzio, 57 times in front of his horrified pregnant wife. After giving birth to a son, James, Mary had a nervous breakdown. 
she suffered hysterical blindness, but she made a recovery. Darnley fell ill, either from smallpox, syphilis, or poisoning, and while recovering away from his wife and child, his bedroom exploded. His body was found, along with that of his servant, half-naked, lying in a nearby orchard, strangled and smothered. The queen offered a generous reward for information about her husband's murder, but suspicion soon fell on her and her friend James Hepburn, Earl of Bothwell. Mary went to visit her 10-month-old son. It would be the last time she saw him. On her ride home, Bothwell abducted and possibly raped her. They were married just three months after Darnley's death. Suspicion turned to outrage and the lords arrested their queen. She was imprisoned in Edinburgh where crowds jeered her. There she miscarried twins. As soon as she was well enough to get out of bed, she was forced to sign papers of abdication, handing the throne to her one-year-old son, James. Bothwell managed to escape to Denmark, where he raised an army to rescue Mary, but on his return, his ships were blown to Norway, the birthplace of his first wife, whom he had abandoned. There he was arrested, chained to a pillar for 11 years, and died insane. The former Queen Mary managed to escape Edinburgh and make her way to England in a fishing boat. She was confident that her cousin Elizabeth would help her regain her throne. Instead, she was arrested and put on trial in London. She was held under house arrest for 19 years. Mary enjoyed a luxurious incarceration with plenty of servants, fine food and wine, entertainment and visitors. Some of those guests were Catholic conspirators who wanted to assassinate Elizabeth and put Mary on the English throne. Elizabeth's spymasters interceded letters, proof of Mary's double dealings, and she was sentenced to death. Elizabeth was wary of further antagonizing the many Catholic monarchs already against her, and of setting the precedent that one monarch could execute another. But, in the end, Elizabeth signed Mary's death warrant. Mary, Queen of Scots, wore red sleeves, the color of a Catholic martyr, to her execution at Farthingay Castle. The inexperienced axeman missed and struck the queen in the back of the head. His second blow severed her neck but left a bit of sinew, which he sawed apart with the axe. After this barbarous butchering, he grabbed Mary's head by the hair and held it aloft, but the head tumbled to the ground as her auburn tresses had actually been a wig. The queen's head was covered in gray stubble. Her lips continued to move for a quarter of an hour. Elizabeth denied Mary's request to be buried in France, where she had spent her happiest years. Instead, the Queen of Scots was given a Protestant funeral and buried at Peterborough Cathedral. Sixteen years later, in 1603, Queen Elizabeth died. She had never officially named an heir, but her counselors raced north to inform the next person in the line of succession, King James VI of Scotland, that he was now King James I of England. In the final episode, we'll find out what happened when the kings of Scotland inherited the throne of England and learn what the Scots thought of the English chopping off one king's head, exiling another, and finally inviting a German to take the throne. All this fascinating Scottish history makes me long to return to the Highlands, and I want you to come with me. I'll be hosting a historic group tour of Scotland from May 15th to 21st, 2024. Over seven days, we'll experience the highlights of Scottish history, from lowlands to highlands. We'll see the honors of Scotland at Edinburgh Castle, Bronze Age burial chambers at Balnurin of Clava, Eilindonan Castle, the Living History Highlands Folk Museum, Dunkeld Cathedral, the mystical Isle of Skye, and so much more. And most amazingly, we'll be doing it all with a group of fellow history lovers and a local guide. Click on the link in the description to reserve your place on this historic trip today. I can't wait to meet you 
in Scotland. Don't want to wait to see the next episode? Patrons get exclusive early access to all of my multi-part series. If you would like to join my Patreon and help me make more fascinating videos, click on the link in the description. Thank you for watching.